My name is Marta, and in this Red Gaming Tech video, I'm here with the latest from the tech world in the last 24 or so hours, as per usual. So what do I have for you today? Well, I'm going to kick things off with some bad news for any miners watching who might own a NVIDIA GTX 1060. We also have an update for Intel 10NM Canon Lake, as the i5-8269U has been spotted. We also have some interesting news regarding Windows 10 UWP protection. Intel has also revealed how much trouble it is in regarding Meltdown and Spectre. And finally, I just want to expand a little bit more on something I mentioned in that video the other day regarding the AMD boot kit. I did kind of just sort of fly past it and I feel like I just want to expand upon that a little bit. So, as I said, let's kick things off with NVIDIA and the 1060. Basically, you can skip this section if you're not interested at all in cryptocurrency mining, but even if you're not a miner yourself, you still might, still might want to learn that the 1060 is basically useless in a mining rig now, as basically the WCCF Tech editor, a fellow by the name of Keith May, discovered something, and you can find a link to this article in the description below. Basically, the Ethereum mining is now over 3 gigabytes in size. Now, you might go, what does that mean? Basically... It means that the graphics memory required to mine Ethereum, which obviously is one of the more popular cryptocurrencies at the moment, is now over 3 gigabytes in size, basically meaning the more sort of cheaper end of the 1060s you now cannot use to mine Ethereum. Now obviously there is a small portion of memory that is dedicated on every graphics card for OS and other such things as well. So while the actual file size is smaller than 3 gigs when you count all that other stuff in as well, then not so much. So you might say, okay, why has this suddenly happened? It's not like it came out and it was useless for mining. Basically, it's caused by the recent Windows update. It is now not possible due to this to mine Ethereum on a normal Windows build with the 3 gigabyte 1060. Now, there are obviously options for miners, like, you know, Windows Server or Linux or what have you, but on just a regular Windows build, uh -uh, no go, Sonny. So what does this actually mean? Well, since Ethereum is a popular choice among cryptocurrency miners, we're probably going to see the 3 gigabyte variant of the 1060 drop in price as demand for that GPU does decrease. And we'll probably see the prices for the 6 gigabyte variants increase ever further. And obviously, the more upscale GPUs will probably see a small price increase due to the increase in demand as well. And we're probably going to see a flood of secondhand 1060s on the market as well, which of course is just going to generally decrease the value of that GPU. Obviously, all of this is speculation, but I'd say it's fairly reasonable speculation and wouldn't be out of this world to expect. So probably not wholly relevant to a lot of you watching, but still interesting to note nonetheless. However, let us move on swiftly to Intel, shall we? So we're going to kick our Intel segment off with 10NM Canon Lake. You may recall Paul did mention a processor which was spotted in Sysoff Sandra database the other day, but now we have another one being spotted in that very same database and has given us the first specs of a quad-core Canon Lake chip, the i5-8269U. And this is, again, quad-core with SMT. Now, the eagle-eyed among you, or those of you with good memories, may think, hmm, okay, this sounds pretty good and kind of remains, reminds me, excuse me, of the i5 KB Lake R processor. However, we are looking at a decent bump in base clock speed comparatively to that. So what do we have for you? Well, as you can see on the screen right about now, the clock speed for this is... 2.60 gigahertz and again is four cores eight threads and we also have four times 256 kilobytes of l2 cache and six megabytes of l3 unfortunately we don't know the boost clocks which is obviously fairly important for any processor however it wouldn't be unreasonable to probably roughly estimate around the four gigahertz mark but to be honest, these recent leaks point to something that is more positive on the whole, as of course it means that we're finally, finally going to see Canon Lake come out. Because obviously it's been delayed and delayed and delayed, and it got to the point where like, they're just going to not release Canon Lake at this rate. But no, with all these recent leaks, it looks like it is not far off the horizon, and it's looking pretty good actually, I must say. Obviously, we need to hold off until we get the full specs for the full range and obviously get, you know, benchmarks and all that sort of stuff. But this gives us a good look-see as to what to expect for 10NM when it finally comes out from Intel. So let's move on to our second Intel item, which is regarding Meltdown and Spectre. 
Now, it's not exactly a secret that Meltdown and Spectre are a absolutely massive just mess. I mean, a mess does not seem like a strong enough word, to be honest with you. It is just a huge field of destruction where, like, smoking rubble and, like, dazed people wandering around going, oh, what happened? I don't understand. I'm so confused. And they've been sued, or are being sued, rather, numerous times over this. And, well, you know... Rightfully so as well. Anyway, regardless of that, we also have news from the company themselves regarding just how much trouble they're in regarding this, as they have revealed in a PDF which was sent to the US Securities and Exchange Commissions that it is now facing 30, you heard me right, 30, as in three zero customer class action lawsuits and two securities class action lawsuits related to these vulnerabilities. Now, Intel themselves say of the consumer lawsuits, quote, generally claim to have been harmed by Intel's actions and or omissions in connections with the security vulnerabilities and, of course, seeking money and equitable relief and so on for damages. The securities also allege violation of securities laws by, quote, making statements about Intel's products and internal controls that were revealed to be false or misleading by the disclosure. Now, obviously, Intel is not just going to lie down and take it, but like, yep, yep, sue me, daddy, it's fine. Obviously, they are going to be coming at this with their army of extremely well-paid lawyers. However, they weren't willing to speculate on exactly where this money is going to be coming from, how much this is going to impact them as a company, how much is going to impact their bottom line. Obviously, it's not cheap to defend against this many class action lawsuits. You know, as I just said, they're... Their lawyers are good, but, you know, they probably charge like a million pounds an hour or something. Obviously, I'm being facetious, but you get my point. However, they have said, excuse me, regarding this, quote, Given the procedural posture and the nature of these cases, including that the procedures are in the early, early stages, that alleged damages have not been specified, that uncertainty exists as to the likelihood of a class or classes being certified, or the ultimate size of any class or classes if certified, and that there are significant factual and legal issues to be resolved, we are unable to make a reasonable estimate of the potential loss or range of losses, if any, that might arise from these matters. So basically, they're just saying, hey, we don't know what's going to happen with these cases, we don't know how many of them are actually going to you know, get to the sort of paying the expensive lawyer stage, and obviously how many of them are going to be successful if they get to that stage, and that's not unreasonable, to be fair. They don't know at the moment how it's much it's going to cost them. I'm sure they'd love to say that, yeah, it's going to cost us like 5p. No, they don't know, and it's obviously going to cost them a lot more than that to try and fight this on so many fronts as well. Now, one last interesting thing that I want to mention from this PDF is that in the filing, Intel itself said three shareholders each filed derivative actions, basically saying that certain board members and officers at Intel did engage in insider trading. Now, obviously, we have discussed in the past the fact that the Intel CEO did sell off a huge amount of company shares prior to disclosing the fact that, hey, by the way, Meltdown and Spectre are a thing. And obviously that was kind of suspicious with the timing, but it was a pre-scheduled plan, but obviously to kind of raise eyebrows. And there have obviously been numerous other concerns as well regarding insider trading. So basically the pain has not yet stopped for Intel You know, with this. They're going to be facing off this for quite some time. Obviously, they're a huge company with several boatloads of cash, so obviously they're not overly concerned, but obviously, if let's say, in, in pretend land for a second, that each of these class actions were successful, you know, that could be extremely expensive. I doubt that will happen, but it is technically possible, so I'm sure they do wish they weren't facing it on literally 32 counts, but... Uh, that they are, that they are, and it's probably not going to end there, as, of course, the US government is also ticked off with them as well. And on the list of people or entities, I guess, that you don't want to upset, I'd say the US government's pretty high up on there, especially if you're a corporation operating on US soil. Anyway, with that said, let's move on to our very brief segment regarding Windows 10 and UWP. Now, this particular item moment is going to be very brief, as it is actually regarding cracking. I don't usually like to discuss piracy items for obvious reasons. However, the reason I want to mention this is it does actually reveal the insane amount of DRM that is actually present in Windows 10 UWP protection. So, obviously, you know, various um, cr- hacker, well, hackers, that's the wrong word, excuse me, Various, uh, you know, cracking groups and that sort of thing have been fairly successful at getting past, like, Denuvo and Ubisoft protection and that sort of thing, but UWP has been a tougher nut to crack, and now we know why. Basically, on the game Zoo Tycoon Ultimate Animal Collection, it has five different layers of DRM. Five. We've got MS Store, UWP, EA, PPX, Expo Live, and Arxen. So, unsurprisingly, it took those people a long time to crack this game, but... 
I just wanted to draw attention to the fact that they put five layers of DRM on this game. Five. Now, obviously, that's not to say that every game ever with UWP has this many, but given that this is a fairly unknown title, I would think it would be odd for this fairly unknown, at least to me, game to have this many layers and for their big games like, say, Gears of War 4 or Forza 7 or something like that to not have this and more. And obviously, you know, they're not wrong to try and protect their game, to try and at least slow down the pirates from getting into their game, but we have seen the performance impacts and other impacts that this DRM can have, and I just think that 5 might be a bit excessive, but that's just me. Obviously, DRM is a thorny issue and this video is not the place to discuss it, but I just thought it was interesting to get a little sort of peek behind the curtain as to exactly how Microsoft have kept this game hack or crack free, excuse me, I keep saying hacking when I mean cracking, for over a year. So, you know, five layers of DRM kept them out for a year. So if they wanted to slow them down, then obviously they were successful. <laughs> anyway, so our final item for today is a revisit of that AMD boot kit that I mentioned the other day, which of course was for Raven Ridge. So as I said, AM4 is designed to be backwards compatible and AMD have stuck to their promise to stick with the same socket and all of that throughout the Ryzen life cycle. However, as I mentioned in my previous video video, excuse me, about this, motherboards running older BIOS revisions just might be like nah, I'm not gonna boot if you just you know plonk it in and boot your PC as normal. So if you head over to the support page, which you can find linked in the below, you can request a boot kit. Now, what this actually is, is a AMD A6 9500 dual-core 3.50 GHz processor, which is a Bristol Ridge-based APU. So basically, you have this because it, you know, it, it can run that, and then obviously you can update your BIOS so you can run Raven Ridge, basically, is what this is for. Now, obviously, you have to send this back to them after you're done, but you interestingly get to keep the heatsink which is uh, kind of intriguing, but it's probably just a nice effort from AMD to be like, hey, we want you to not have to cough up a kidney to send this to us. Now, this isn't really going to be a thing for the long term, obviously. They're going to be shipping out newer motherboards that will support Raven Ridge out of the box, but for people who already have M4 motherboards, but, you know, perhaps the Ryzen 5s or whatever, then this is definitely going to be useful. And obviously, if you might, you might buy an older motherboard that's already available, even if you don't already own one, simply because, hey, it's a cheaper option or it's already there or... You want to spread out the cost over a couple of months or whatever. So this is a very interesting sort of workaround. Like, hey, we'll send you out this Bristol Ridge APU. Use it to update your BIOS and send it back to us. But, you know, keep the heatsink because, you know, it's it's fine. So just a sort of a bit of expansion on that as I did kind of fly past it in my previous video. I just kind of want to give it a bit more attention, especially as Paul himself has touched on this particular topic in an article, which, of course, will be linked in the description below this video alongside the PDF from Intel that I was referencing earlier as well. And of course, the link to the boot kit where you can apply for that from AMD if you're at all interested in getting your hands on Raven Ridge, which of course is insanely cheap and a pretty good way to play you know, un undemanding games like Overwatch and so on and that sort of thing. So with all that said, that is me done for this video. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.